and welcome to this bonus episode of Texas Podcast Massacre. My name is Lisa, and my guest with me today is Patricia. Hello there. How are you? Doing pretty well. Uh, so a little bit of background for you guys. This is the first time we're doing this. Um, I decided that there's just some things I cannot say uh, in our normal episodes, mainly because Mitch and Nate are talkers, if you guys couldn't tell. And uh, also because I'm the only unsuspecting victim most of the time. So um, we're going to start this up and it, it'll kind of be just a little safe space and uh, talk whatever we want to talk about. If we want to complain some more about the movie and why we had to watch horrible, horrible things like Tourist Trap. Um, or if we just want to talk about something else entirely. Because usually after I have to suffer through these movies, I like to decompress, do something entirely different watch a comedy show, read a book, something before I have to go to bed um, and deal with the nightmares that are coming. So that's my background for this. Now, Patricia's at a slight disadvantage since this is our first time. Um, We're actually going to be talking about a horror movie because it relates to our next episode. So next episode is going to be Bird Box. Um, And the boys already did an episode on A Quiet Place back when it came out. Um, Damien was really little then, so I didn't make that episode. Um, and Patricia wasn't on it either. So now it's our turn to talk a little bit about the movie, give y'all a recap, and then we might spend a few minutes at the end doing our own little decompression, um, from having to, to go through reliving the traumatic events of a quiet place. Um, so Patricia, you know, we normally do it on the show. I'll, I'll, I'll let you throw it to you. So as an unsuspecting victim watching a quiet place, give me a one to two sentence summary of, of what it's about. Okay. So, uh, I guess some sort of creature or alien of, of some kind has uh, taken over the earth that, uh, the way it detects its victims is by hearing the noises that they make. And, uh, Jim Halpert and his family, uh, have survived in part because one of their children is deaf. And so they all know sign language. And so they're able to communicate silently. Um, most of them survive, I should say. And I have a lot of comments on that. Yeah, me too. Okay. I like it. Um, so first impressions, I'll, uh, I'll say, uh, I didn't this, I'll say it was well done in so far as it was terrifying to me. It was just really scary. Um, I'm starting to think a lot of these movies get scarier after you become a parent and, and you just became one as well. So you, can kind of get that feeling, but you know, I've never liked the harming of children in movies, but once you have your own, it just, I feel it hits you in the feels a little deeper. So overall thoughts on this one. Well, so I agree with you. Um, and I like, like you mentioned, I have been a parent for a little over three months now, so I'm definitely an expert in all <laughs> things parenting. Just, Oh yeah. Three right months th- is plenty. Right. So I have a lot of critiques to make on their parenting skills. Uh, but I can hold off if we're getting into the plot points later. Yeah. So just overall like it, hated it. Uh, I liked it. It was pretty scary. I am someone who, uh, is not the terror level typically goes down for me as soon as I see any sort of monster or sci-fi type thing, because it just, you know, I, I really get scared by things that can actually happen in real life. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, if I'm driving home from here tonight, for example, and, uh, you know, a murderer could be waiting for me. That's way scarier than, uh, something that looks like venom from the Spider-Man movies. Ear thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Typically I'm with you on that one. Although this one, uh, for me, at least I think seeing the creatures up the tension for me, Mm -hmm. cause just having them be like right there, you know, right next to them. Uh, not able to see them though. It just kind of freaked me out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about, let's get into the plot a little bit. Um, and these episodes are going to be a little shorter. So, if, so if we seem rushed, it's, we're going to get into the groove, uh, once we do some more of these, but let's, let's talk a little bit about the family. So, uh, we were saying, I don't think they ever give each other names, um, which is totally fine, uh, because they know each other, so they don't really have to call each other by name. Um, so you have Jim Halpert, obviously, as we've mm-hmm. said, uh, played by John Krasinski. You have his wife, uh, Emily Blunt, call her Mary Poppins. <laughs> uh, 
for those of you that have seen her new movie. Um, and then you have at the beginning, three children, um, and later on a fourth on the way. Um, so we start off with them doing some, um, not pillaging, but you know, they go on a, a little mission to get more medicine. Scavenging. Scavenging. There you go. Yeah. Scavenging to get uh, supplies. And um, their youngest, I believe, is supposed to be about four years old. Um, so so all of these kids were alive before this happened um, and have some sense of what the real world was like before this, this monster took over. Because I think at this point, it's only been about three months. Yeah. Um, and the littlest one finds a toy rocket and he loves rockets, loves space, wants to take it with him. Uh, his dad says, absolutely not, no way. Um, and his very sweet sister, realizing he's only four years old, he just wants a toy, hands it to him, not realizing he took the batteries. So opening thoughts on this whole scavenger hunt. So definitely felt bad for the little boy because that sucks. Yeah. I did feel like the father could have maybe, I don't know, headed this off at the pass by confiscating the batteries and then giving him the yes. toy Thank right you. there. I mean, all of the drama that takes place after this comes from leaving a deaf child and a child under the age of reason uh, alone with yeah. a toy that they really want and batteries. Yeah. And the one who has reached the age of reason uh, I guess has been deaf since birth. Uh, they don't specify, but it's certainly implied, it seems that right? Way, yeah, uh, and maybe doesn't fully understand how dangerous right. things are. Yeah, right. So uh, definitely deducting a few dad points from Jim Halpert. Completely, because I was like, look, he doesn't need batteries, and I was trying to logic it out with Mitch because that was really bothering me. And I guess they thought even without the batteries, if he's like, you know, clanking it on the table. Might be too loud because later on they're playing Monopoly and they're literally playing with like, you know, fuzz and yeah. stuff to be totally quiet. So I kind of get it. At the same time, he's four years old. I realize it's a post-apocalyptic situation, but he's four years old. He doesn't quite get it just yet. You know? Yeah. Maybe they could have taken skills it. skills aren't there yet. Yeah. Taking it, giving him a stuffed animal. Yeah. Like, don't just take. You also right. give. Yeah. yeah. Completely agree. And the other thing that bothered me is them just walking out and being like, okay, they'll, they'll come eventually. Right. I'm like, Here's the thing. That no. is my biggest problem with this entire film is again, I'm an expert parent <laughs> yes. right now. Uh, my child's not walking yet, but I have full confidence that we're going to just nail lines from day one. Uh, the order in which you walk, if you are a family of five and there are monsters that can pick up on the slightest noise. Because as you pointed out, they're playing Monopoly on like felt. Yeah. Right. Uh, is It does not go dad, mom, oldest child, deaf child, four-year-old. Yeah. With, you know, what was that? Maybe 15 yards between each yes, person. It was terrible. Right. That's just, that's just a bad call. It's you, only been three months. You can't be that comfortable with the situation. Definitely not. I mean, and, and later on in the movie, Emily Blunt was, you know, chastising herself saying, oh, I could have carried him. He wasn't that heavy. No, you didn't need to carry him. You just needed to walk behind him. And then or when he starts his hand. Yeah. And when he starts pulling out a gigantic, uh, rocket ship. Yeah. Maybe just take it away from take him. Take it away from him or stuff it back in his bag. Yeah. The, Easily could have been avoided. Yeah. I mean, I feel sorry for them, but got me. That was that was terrible call. And my kid is mobile. He's he can move. And so it is a constant struggle to keep things out of his grip that he should not have. So already I have that sense of I got to keep an eye on him because certainly he's going to go for, you know, my drink that he's not supposed to have or this. that. He's already spilled countless food items on me (laughs) because I always underestimate his reach. So you, you got to keep an eye on this thing. Um, so they're going along. They're going home. The, the youngest pulls out the rockets, put in the batteries, makes noise, immediately gets taken. Um, very, very sad. Yeah. Very, very horrible. Um, it's one of those ones that, you know, Mitch is sure if we had seen it, if I had gone to theaters, I probably would have just walked out and been like, you know what? I'm done. Um Emily Blunt was in an interview and apparently as she was filming Mary Poppins, John Krasinski was writing a quiet place. And so apparently she came home one day 
And she and he's like, how did it go? And she's like, oh, it's great. You know, we did this big, wonderful dancing and we were laughing and singing and all this stuff. And he's like, how was your day? Oh, I just killed a kid in a script. <laughs> so she was like, it was a bit weird him working on something so dark while I was working on something so light and bright. But um, but yeah, so totally, you know, we're what, 10 minutes into the movie, if that yeah. turning point um, completely, We've completely lost faith in them as parents and oh, they've lost a child. I know it's terrible. Um, and it, and it surprises me for other choices that are made down the line. Yeah. Um, so we cut to, uh, about a year later, a little over a year later, um, they're living in their house, which is amazing, which they've set up very, very well. Yeah. Um, they have security cameras, uh, they have all sorts of stuff. They have lights set up to, to lead them, guide them home and be a warning system. Um, yeah, so very all sorts impressive. of contingency plans in place. It's yes. Yeah. Pretty amazing. It's, it was pretty well done for, for a year's worth of work. Uh, they've, they've done a good job and you never know about their backgrounds, but they've obviously picked up books along the way and they're teaching themselves how to do these things and they're going along. But it's pretty amazing that they did all of that in silence. I have to add, like did all of that installation. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so before we get too much further into, I have to ask you this cause this is something Mitch and I talked about. How long would you last in this situation? Oh, not at all. I'm shockingly uh, clumsy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I trip over everything. Um, I come from a loud family. Uh, we are just loud people. We we crash around. Um, I would have been dead within like five minutes. Yeah. So I took a huge spill this past weekend while holding Damien. And we both went down and it was bad. And we screamed and yelled. And I just... There's no way. And then I told Mitch, I was like, we would never be able to tell a joke because we are laugh out loud yeah. laughers. You know, we don't, we can't, we would have to try to silently laugh and it would be very difficult. So I, I talk in my sleep. So I <laughs> That's not wouldn't good. even last through the night. If I, ma- if I made it through the first day, I would not make it through the first night. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So not, not a good situation yeah. for either of us. Um, so they're living you uh, in this situation. You see that Emily Blunt is pregnant. Um, okay. It's like bad call. Sure. Bad call guys. Of all the things. I, I mean, I get it. There's not much to do, <laughs> so that's fine, but still, you know, take precautions. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can do. You, you're clearly going on scavenging. Yeah. Trips. You were just in a grocery store. Yeah. You get supplies. Um, so, uh, so she's pregnant and, uh, keeping track of kind of her blood pressure and, and everything that's going on. Um, and you sense a little tension between the dad and the daughter, um, you know, come to find out it's because he says he doesn't blame her, but she blames herself. And I think psychologically he blames her a little bit. Yeah. She clearly holds happened. a lot of guilt. Uh, yeah. He clearly presents her at least a little bit. He has complicated feelings. Yeah. So there's a little bit of tension between them. Um, and they're all just trying to survive, right? And you, you see them trying to do normal family things, cook dinner, play Monopoly, just kind of trying to lead as normal of lives as you can in, in this sort of situation. Um, there's a point where they do cause an accidental sound. They knock over a lantern and they kind of panic. Um, but luckily, um, I guess the thing lost the sense of where the sound was and, and went away. Um, so we get to, to John Krasinski wanting to take his son out, presumably to go fishing. Um, and collect more supplies and he does not want to go. Um, and I do not blame this child because his brother was taken. Yeah. Um, so he's begging not to go. And in a heartbreaking fashion to me, the mom is just, I, I, I don't know that I could do that. I, if my son was begging me to stay, I don't know that I could say, go with your father, you know? And the girl was begging to go. Yeah. Which was tragic also. Yeah. Because and they wouldn't he wouldn't her. take her. Yeah. So all around just a sad situation. Um, one tidbit here, nitpicky thing for me. She kind of knew when her due date was roughly. I don't think it was the best thing for him to go off for the entire day. I feel like go for 30 minutes and come back and check on her. Because at some point. Even now with all our modern medical marvels and a non-post-apocalyptic situation, there's a point where the doctor's like, don't go 
anywhere. Yeah. You, you stay where you are. You stay with someone who can get you to the hospital. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. If, uh, if my husband had decided to just, uh, take a day trip within a couple of weeks of my due date for really no reason. I mean, I know they were fishing, but he definitely could have. They lingered. Yeah. Yeah. They lingered. Maybe you don't need like the father son bonding moment at this particular trip. You yeah. leave someone who's not deaf at home to take care of mom. Exactly. In the event that something she goes happens. into labor. Um, but yeah, I think I would have been pretty furious if my husband had decided to just go on a little day trip. Yeah. A couple weeks before my due date. I, I appreciated the father son bonding moment behind the waterfall. That was nice. Um, but I was annoyed with him. I was like, go home, go home. That baby's coming, go home. And the, and this is their fourth child, you know? So unless all those other babies came like perfectly on their due date, they should know by now. Yeah. They have experience in this sort of situation. So, so they're off fishing. Um, the daughter puts on the headpiece. And, and to me, it's a little uncertain whether it's working or not working. I guess it's working a little bit. Yeah, I wish we had seen a little bit more of that plot line yeah. developed because I just, that was interesting. It was yeah. a really cool thing for her father to be doing, but I feel like we didn't get enough of it. Yeah. So so she decides she's going to go visit her little brother's grave. Um, great and just, plan. And just wanders off. Yeah, great plan. And I'm like, your four-year-old died. Where are your other children right now? I know. Uh, also, why wasn't she in school? Right. Because yeah. the little boy was getting uh, lessons, less yeah. school lessons. Uh, she was just kind of a lost child. Yeah. I mean, I guess maybe they all harbored a little bit of, I don't know, th- there was some tension yeah. between her and everyone in the family, I think, right. except her brother. But I don't know. That was to me weird because the mom was like, oh, she was right here with me until I went to do laundry. And then I just don't know where she went. And I'm like, <laughs> you lost a four year old. Yeah. I would be like, you are staying right here by my side. At all times, you do not move, you know, help me with the laundry. Especially one who doesn't know when she's making noise. Yeah. For example. Also, here's the thing. This was another very small thing, but I did quibble with it. Out of all the articles of clothing you can wear, I would say skirts are one of the noisiest. They are. I mean. And hardest to run in. Lycra. Yeah. Just wear leggings. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be set in you know, roughly the current time period, which means I'm assuming that uh, Lululemon and various, you know, <laughs> athleisure yeah, yeah. <laughs> lines were still popular, meaning that on all of their scavenging trips, if they didn't already own that gear, right. they could have picked up some form-fitting, uh, quiet clothing yeah. that was meant for running, meant for performance. Exactly. And instead, they have this deaf girl running through, like, cornfields with yeah. tall grasses in a skirt. Also, it just hit me, too. Washing machines are not quiet. And wasn't she using a machine? Oh, I think you're right. Yeah. Okay. Maybe. So little things here and there that I just don't. Yeah. The skirt really bothered me. Shouldn't have. But I was like. Well, because the mom was wearing one, too, wasn't she? Yeah. But at least she can hear when she's like rustling right. around. That's the little true. girl can't. Yeah. 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 Sure. She knows when she knocks over a lantern, that's going to set the whole place on fire right. that it probably made a noise. Yeah. But uh, she doesn't necessarily know when she's, when her skirt that's not attached to her body yeah. is fluttering through some leaves and exactly. stuff. So, so a little bit of plot holes here and there. Yeah. Obviously. Um, so we get to the point where Emily Blunt is sitting in her son's room reminiscing being very sad that that part got me. Um, and she goes into labor. Super huge props and kudos to Emily Blunt for dealing with this pregnancy silently. Yeah. It, that is incredible. Yeah. Cause I was like, you know, having just gone through it a little less than a year and you, you know, a few months ago, that shit's hard. I mean, I was, uh, I was begging for an epidural, like 45 minutes into labor. Yes. As soon as my <laughs> I had water zero broke, tolerance for that, <laughs> I was like, give it to me. And, yeah. and her water breaks right there. Yeah. She's having to move through the house. She steps on a nail. Ah, oh my gosh. Ah, that still gives me a, oh. and just the scene of her peeling her foot off the nail. I was like, Oh, I can't take it. Oh, so that was amazing. Yeah. Um, 
Side note, that little uh, coffin they made, not coffin, but the little thing they made oh for the baby gosh. with the oxygen tank. I hated that. I like almost had a panic attack I, looking yeah, at that. Yeah, me too. I couldn't take it. And I was just imagining because my baby at the time was only that I was watching this was less than two months yeah. or about two months old. No. And I just could not imagine putting a tiny little newborn into this box. Oh, it's awful. And, and closing all the night. Lid. Oh my gosh. That. Yes. It was so terrible. I, I kept telling Mitch, like I said it several times about the movie before she had the baby. I was like, this isn't going to work. This is yeah. not going to work. I mean, my son still screams now. There's no way you could logic with a one-year-old and be like, you can't talk or yeah. we're going to die. You know? Um, yeah, you're right. Newborn's probably easier than Yeah. Newborns, you could probably keep quiet a little bit more. You, you close nurse them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but a toddler? Whew, no way. You couldn't even, they couldn't uh-uh. even get their four-year-old quiet. Yeah. There's no way. Um, but that box did, was very devastating yeah. to me. Just even um, watching it. That was probably the saddest part of the movie to oh me. was gosh. watching what that newborn was going to have to go I through. I know. It's so awful. And then, um, okay. So she has the baby. Um, John Krasinski and the son are coming back. See the red warning lights. Um, and she's attracted a monster into the house because she's made some noise um, and uh, manages to evade it a couple times. But once Krasinski sees that light, he runs full sprint and tells the son initiate the rocket sequence um, and sends his son off alone. Yeah. And this is the kid that was, that was hesitant, you know, I know he had to do it. I'm I sure know it killed he him. did too, but I felt for that kid in that moment. I know. It's terrifying enough to be outside in the dark like that yeah. and then have to go and do that. But he was a tough kid and he got it done. Um, he was brave. So he sets the fireworks off, which brilliant plan, by the way. They've, they've yeah. thought of a lot. I'll give them that. Yeah. Um, draws the creatures away. Krasinski goes in, finds Emily Blunt, takes her and the new baby down to his soundproof basement. Um, which, why aren't you just aren't staying down there? there most of the time? Why aren't they living there? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I know it's a little depressing because you're down there, but as soon as I found out they lived in an area that had basements, uh, yeah. why, why are you living above the ground? Come on. Um, so it takes her down there, uh, and then leaves to find the kids because they had a heart to heart and they're like, what are we, if we can't protect our children? So he goes off to find the kids, uh, come to find out a pipe burst. I'm still not sure that how was that was a little happened. confusing. Somehow a pipe burst. And I then- didn't know if one of the creatures accidentally busted it when they were rummaging around the house, maybe. But um But it filled up fast. Let's just say did. this. The basement filled up very quickly. It did. And it would depress me if you if we had gone to all that work to soundproof the basement and then it floods. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So you um Emily Blunt realizes the water's coming in. The lid is off of the baby's box. And my immediate thought was that the creature already got the baby. I didn't realize they took the lid off when they realized the soundproofness had worked. And so yeah. I was like, oh my God, they got the baby. Oh, and so Mitch was like, you, no, they haven't. Not yet. Did you know that there was still a creature in there? Or did another, did a creature get back in? I think a creature came back because of the water. Okay. Because of the sounds of the water, I think a, another creature came. Okay. Um, so you see the creature. The door. Yeah. So you see the creature in the basement. The creature dives under the water in a that very was super creepy, creepy way. That was super creepy. Um, she grabs the baby. Creature pops up right in front of them. Um, and they have to... Oh, gosh. I don't even know. How, how did they get out of the basement? Did they cause a distraction? I think someone set off... I was, I was really trying to figure out where the creature came from. Yeah. So, so this they, is where the whole plot gets really fuzzy for they me. They get out of there somehow. And um, John is out searching for the kids, realizes they're in a grain silo. Um, they attract a creature to them because they're making too much noise. And her hearing aid sets off a high-pitched frequency, freaks the creature out, and it busts through a hole in the wall, and they're able to get out. They find John... Um, Real quick about uh-huh. the grain silo or corn or yeah. whatever that is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is something I have no experience with. Does grain <laughs> act like, like quicksand, quicksand? I know. to Thank that extent? You. Because that, that was, was a, a little r- much. That was a real shocker for <laughs> that me. Was a little much. That was a, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> me too. I was surprised how quickly they were sinking. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. If if anyone knows how grain silos work, please email us, tweet us at Texas Podcast. Because that was instant. Yeah. Real quick. Yeah. It was like that a was Super Mario. Faster than Treyu and faster than uh, Princess Bride. Yeah. It was just fast. Instant. So, um, so they get out, they find John, they're together, um, until another creature comes. John decides he's going to try and kill it. He sends the kids off to the safety of the truck, um, and just all hell breaks loose. And he realizes that the only way to save his children, because, uh, once he got hit, the little boy leans out the door and screams dad, which attracts the creature to the kids and he realizes the only way to protect his children, because that's what he's meant to do, is to sacrifice himself. I hated that. Oh, I hated that. Because at this point, let's be honest, by sacrificing himself, he's basically dooming them, right? But I mean, I, I agree that that's what he had to do. That's That was basically his only option. Yeah. But it was pretty bleak because, it was. I mean, Emily Blunt has just given birth to a child yeah. She now has three children, one of whom is deaf. Yeah. One of whom is a newborn. Yeah. That she has to single handedly take care of. I mean, and all of these creatures are roaming around the property. Yeah. I mean, in that moment, I think it was supposed to be sacrificial and, and maybe a bit uplifting. I don't know, but uh, no, it was to me it was devastating. Just depressing. Yeah. And then they find their way back to Emily Blunt. Where's the baby? She runs out to give them a hug. Hello, and there's no baby in her arms. And so she left it in the laundry basket, I think, downstairs. Yeah, she she put a lot of faith in uh, in having gotten rid of all of those monsters, yeah. given that she just woke up and her basement was flooded and there was another monster. And you're leaving a baby alone who inevitably will cry. Yeah. And, and there's the, no one there to protect it. The only way to soothe the baby at that age is mama. Yeah. Right? So Yeah, so that was a little sketchy to me. Um, so they're together. They think they're safe. They realize there's another creature there. Um, this is the first time the daughter's been in the basement looking at everything her father has set up, um, realizes her father has been trying with all his heart and soul to make her hearing aid work and do things for his daughter, realizes how much his, her dad loved her and then just loses it. I mean, fairly, you know, there's, there's no reason she shouldn't. Yeah. Um, and her and Emily are having a scene where they realize what they've lost. Uh, when another creature comes in, it clicks that she's got this mechanism and that hearing aid to distract these creatures. Um, they distract that first one shot goes, goes off and they're victorious, but then you realize these other creatures are coming. Um, so they get ready to do it again. Um, so ending, what did, what did you think? Did you like the way it ended? Do you think it was too abrupt? It was a bit abrupt for me, okay. but mostly because I, I just had so many questions in so many different directions. Like I really wanted to get a little bit deeper into the concept of the, um, the hearing aids that he'd been putting together. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand why he wasn't letting his daughter down there to see his progress and to yeah. see what he was doing. That was really confusing to me. Yeah. So there was a lot of secrecy within that family that I didn't understand. Yeah. And I, I wish we could have gotten, I don't know, dug a little deeper a into little some deeper of that. A little deeper into it. Yeah. But it was, it, you know, I didn't dislike it. It just was a little abrupt for me. Right. Um, any other things, thoughts we haven't covered? Pet peeves, plot holes. You know, in general, I was not a fan of the monsters. Okay. Yeah. They looked a lot like Venom to me. I don't know. They looked like a lobster claw. I don't know. Cause at one point it's going up the stairs and it's like holding on to the rail with its claw thing and i was like yeah. that's weird uh but the one under the water was super creepy yeah that one was terrifying yeah to me. that really was so yeah these these creatures were pretty creepy um and up until the point when i when we saw them like when they were just we were just seeing blurs because they were running past that yeah. was terrifying yeah they so, reminded me of venom and uh, they reminded me a lot of the stranger things creature as yes. well yes mm -hmm. yes so a lot of tiebacks to to different um horror horror monsters 
Uh, great. So this is awesome. So hopefully you've listened to this and you'll be able to follow along um, as we talk about Bird Box, because I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about Quiet Place. Um, a lot of similarities there. Uh, just take a couple minutes towards the end here. Do our own tiny decompression. So we were talking a minute ago. And, and for you listeners, this part will be totally random week to week. Just whatever um, I and the guest or guests want to talk about. So we were saying we we just both finished uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, newest, well, I should say Robert Galbraith's newest mystery novel, Lethal White. So, so what'd you think? Uh, I really enjoyed it. I have to say, I think I enjoyed the earlier ones maybe a little bit better. Okay. The first two. Um, but uh, I definitely am glad. Are we allowed to give spoilers? I will, as long as we warn folks, yes. Okay. Let's, so spoiler alert here. If you have not read um, the latest book in the Robert Galbraith series, stop listening. <laughs> I guess I was glad I had been very annoyed by Robin's relationship for a very long time. Yes. And I was super glad that they finally. Yeah. Kind of, you know, tied a bow on that. Yeah, <laughs> I did too. I, I feel like, and I thoroughly enjoyed it, um, you know. I love her writing. I always will. I feel like this was her order of the Phoenix though. Uh, very long, very, a lot of stuff to get through a lot of relationshipy stuff. Um, but, but well done. And I'm happy with the direction the series is, is moving. Yes. She has said before, she's got way more ideas for these novels. Uh, you passed seven Harry Potter novels. So, so she's hopefully going to be writing these for, for, quite a while to come. Um, That's excellent. Yeah. I love British mysteries. Yeah. It's a huge, I'm a huge fan of them. And, uh, and several of my favorite authors have died within the last few years. So it's wonderful to have uh, a a new new one. Yeah. Uh, And I love the Robert Galbraith uh, entire series, but I I love the analogy that this is the order of the Phoenix where it's critical to read. Yeah. But not as enjoyable as the others. Right. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Very, very, complicated yes. lots of fit in and, and i and i see that um and i trust her because yes. i i know she knows where she's going she knows these characters like the back of her hand you know so i i know she's she's gonna take us to even more fun places and the mystery in this one um very good it, yeah. it, it took me quite a while to kind of sort of piece together yeah uh who done it and and why um so, so overall, I, I really enjoyed it and, and I'd recommend it if you've been reading the rest of the series, definitely pick this one up and, oh yeah and, uh, go for it. Maybe, uh, reread or read a recap of the previous one though, yeah because, uh, it picks up immediately. It does. Um, so uh, I had just watched the BBC v- version. I did not know. There was a BBC version. Yes. Are you kidding me? Oh, yeah. The first three novels. Oh, my God. You must watch it. How did I not know this? You must. I do not know how you didn't notice. Oh, my gosh. Yes. It's great. You have so made my day. Each book is well, like two to three episodes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So it's great. It's fantastic. The, okay, well, the I know what I'm doing tonight. that they found for uh, Comrin. I don't, I don't know. I got to I, I was avoiding saying to it, it again. here because I didn't want to make a fool of myself. It's like Hermione when I was a little right. kid. Okay. I called her Hermione until I was like 13. <laughs> until Victor Crumb finally said yes. it. Yeah. Um, they say it on the TV show, but okay. I just can't strike. I'll just I've call always him said Cormoran. Yeah. Uh, who knows? Um, but the, him and Robin are very well cast. Okay. Excellent. Um, so definitely check that out as well. I can recommend that if you, if you need a recap and you don't want to reread the books, the, the TV show is very good. Okay. Um, liked it a lot. So uh, this was the first bonus episode of um, right now we're calling it Lisa's loft, but, but we're, this is in the works. So um, we're going to change the format a little bit as time goes on, but thank you so much for Patricia uh, for joining me. Thank you for having me inaugural episode and everyone tune in um, to our next full length episode with Nate and Mitch, when we'll be discussing bird box. Thank you.